Hello everybody. I am Jeffin Johnson, Assistant Professor of Department of Mechanical Engineering, Rajagiri School of Engineering and Technology. So in this session, we'll be, we will be discussing about the different atom models, atomic interaction, as well as atomic bonding. So if you look into the history of atom models, we can see starting from 1803, John Dalton developed a solid sphere model. The 1904 J.J. Thomson made a plum pudding model, a nuclear model by N.S. Rutherford in 1911, planetary model by Niels Bohr in 1913, Erwin Strongshinger, the quantum model in 1926. So if you look into this model separately, the first one is done by John Dalton. So Dalton drew upon the ancient Greek idea of atoms. That is the word atom comes from the Greek atomos. The meaning, meaning is indivisible. So his theory stated that atoms are indivisible. Those of a given element are identical. And compounds are combinations of different types of atoms. So John Dalton. There was no nucleus. He was not even uh, saying there is a nucleus of positively charged, negatively charged. So he was given a simple solid sphere model. In the second model, there is a plum pudding model that is discovered by J.J. Thomson, 1904. He discovered electrons, which he called corpuscles at, at, at that point of time, in atoms in 1897, for which he won a Nobel Prize. He subsequently produced the plum pudding model of the atom, shows the atom is composed of electrons scattered throughout a spherical cloud of positive charge. So he understood there is a positive charge, there is a negative charge, and that will be mixed, that will be surrounded, that positive charge will be surrounded with the uh, negatively charged particles. The model, you can see a nuclear model done by Ernest Rutherford in 1911. So he fired some positively charged alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil. So most passed through with little deflection, but some deflected at larger angles. So this was only possible if the atom was mostly empty space with the positive charge concentrated in the center of the nucleus. So he understood there is a positive nucleus uh, at the center point of the atom. And there is a, there is a wide vacuum space as available. So that is the reason why some, may, some deflected smaller angles, some deflected larger angles. So there are several, so he made a, some orbits, uh, orbits out of the positive uh, nucleus. That is simply termed as nuclear model. Then there is a planetary model. That's done by Niels Bohr. It was uh, widely uh, accepted uh, at the point of uh, discovery. 1913, Bohr modified the Rutherford's model by the, uh, of the atom by stating that electrons moved around the nucleus in orbits of fixed sizes and energies. Electron energy in this model was quantized. Electrons could not occupy values of energy between the fixed energy levels. So we can see there is a positive nucleus present there with protons and neutrons. And the electrons will be uh, Moving around the moving around the positive nucleus in fixed orbits, that is discrete orbits. But this model has a limitation. It's an obey the uh, the, uh, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So later this model was modified. It's a quantum model. So Erwin Strontinger in 1926 stated that the electrons do not move in set paths around the nucleus, but in waves. So it is impossible to know the ex exact location of the electrons. So instead we, can, we have clouds of probability that are called orbitals in which we are more likely to find an electron. There is a possibility, there is a probability that we could find the electron there rather than uh, simply saying that uh, it will be moving uh, in the fixed orbit. So this was a model nowadays been followed. Limitations for each and every model. If you consider the solid sphere model, it recognized electrons as components of atoms. It's not the pure atoms, it's only about protons and neutrons, and not like that. The electrons are also components of atoms. But there was no nucleus, we didn't explain about those things. Then second model, plum pudding model, this model realized a positive charge was localized in the nucleus of an atom. But still, they didn't explain about why electrons remain in orbit around the nucleus. There was no orbit. You are just making uh, a point that the electrons 
we are would be moving around uh, or it will be like a positive it, it will be like a pudding type of uh, model he made there was no fixed path likewise sort of thing the third model by rutherford he recognized electrons as components of atoms but here also there was no nucleus he didn't explain that thing also but niels bohr uh, realized there is a positive charge as that is localized to the nucleus of atom but still here he didn't say why these electrons remain in the orbit around the nucleus because this model will be applicable to elements having lesser electrons if you consider atomic numbers um, uh, high atomic number elements it will be difficult to study this model on the on the basis of this model then erwin stonchinger proposed a stable electron orbits explain the emission spectra of some elements uh, but moving electrons should emit energy and collapse into the nucleus model did not work well for heavier atoms here also heavier atoms it will not uh, work well so these were the uh, um, findings and the limitations of the different models that we explained so atomic model if you consider there are two types the bohr model and the mechanical model the bohr model we can see the discrete orbits bohr atomic model proposed that electrons orbit around the nucleus in discrete orbitals the k l m n likewise which which are having specific energy levels as well positions of electrons in the orbits it's well defined an electron can change orbit by emitting or absorbing the quanta of energy so suppose we you can see is suppose from the second uh, shell the electron moves to the higher energy level by absorbing energy absorbing photon so now the electron is at a higher energy level it's not stable so electrons will be always having a tendency to be in stable state so it will emit the photon so thereby it will be reaching back to its stable normal uh, state of energy level this is a simple bohr model been explained so there are some limitations as well we could not explain the spectra of at atoms containing more than one electron so it will be clearly clear, uh, clearly giving you the idea of a hydrogen atom that then higher heavier atoms it will be difficult for this model to explain and also it violates the heisenberg's uncertainty principle since bohr's model predict both position and momentum at the same time so it is not actually possible by heisenberg uh, heisenberg's principle then a new model the wave mechanical model in this model the limitations of bohr model was resolved then electrons are considered to behave both wave led wave like and particle like we can only find a region where the probability of uh, finding electron will be there rather than a discrete point where the electrons will be exactly located it could not be possible but we can see that the bohr radius that already calculated by an equation so that is that will be the region where we can have a probability so, so there is significant also the bohr radius also have a particular significance in this model as well electrons are no longer treated as a particle moving in discrete orbitals position of an electron is described by a probability distribution so there is a probability to find an electron so there is a cloud like region that will be present so here we can see Uh, instead of a solid circle we are having a cloud like uh, feature where we can see there is a possibility of electron there and there is if you look at uh, look at the graph there is a probability that the distance from the nucleus if the distance from the nucleus is zero probability is zero then if we increase or uh, the distance is moving away from the nucleus the distance increases gradually so we can see uh, there is a probability so that probability region is same as and its maximum at bohr's radius bohr's radius so even if the bohr's radius bohr's model is not um, uh, giving an idea whether that electron is is moving in the orbits how is it possible but still we can see the bohr's radius could be easily used for to find out a probability region where we can find the electrons so this is the probability distribution of electrons so this is the um wave model so we can see if we consider a fixed circular um orbit the mass of the electron m and the velocity at which it is moving r is the bohr radius 
So this is the equation to find out the bore radius for pi epsilon zero slash square divided by m e square, where m is the mass of the electron, e is the electron charge. And h dash is given by h by 2k, where h is the Planck's constant. You can see from the nucleus, from the graph itself, if the distance from the nucleus increases, there is a point at which we can find out the uh, probability, find out a region where possibility of electron is more. Then quantum numbers. So consider four parameters or numbers called quantum numbers are needed to describe the distribution and position of electrons in an atom. So first three of them, N, L, M, describe the size, shape, and spatial orientation of the probability density distribution of electrons. So if you consider the principal quantum number N, describes electron shells. So we can see one, two, three, four, that is different energy levels, which are normally labeled as K, L, M, N, where K has, is having lower energy. Value of N determines the size or distance of the shells from the nucleus. So n, n the shell means it is very far away from nucleus. And there is an equation to find out the number of electrons in a shell that is given by 2 into n square. So if you are considering the first shell, so 2 into 1 square, that is equal to 2. And second shell is normally labeled as l. 2 uh, n equal to 2, so 2 into 2 square, that is equal to 8. So likewise, we can find out the number of electrons at a particular shell. Then electronic configuration. You can see it's the configuration means a manner in which electron states are occupied in a given atom. So there are several uh, uh, number of shells uh, available and this is the maximum number of ele uh, electrons per the equation. So first shell is 2, then 8, then 18, then 32. And also we can have SPDF like sort of arrangement where this is the way how the electrons will be oriented, uh, the electrons will be configured. So this all shows a stable kind of a configuration. There are two principles also how to fill the shells, the above principle and mainland principle. So that principles give you which is the shell that has to be uh, written in the configuration based on the energy level. For example, after 3p, it's not 3d, the force having lower energy comparing with the 3D. So we have to write 4S before 3D. So such kind of a principle is available in order to properly uh, write the uh, electronic configuration. So if we consider two stable and unstable type examples, so sodium, if you consider, you can see the third shell, only one electron. But up to 2P shell, we can see it's a uh, 2P energy level, you can see it's almost stable. So this electron, if it relieves this uh, particular electron, then we can say sodium uh, as a stable element. So sodium always have a tendency to donate. So that is the reason why it is one of the electropositivity element. But on the other hand, if a stable case can be considered noble gas is one of the argon, one of the noble gases argon, you can see up to 3P6 almost filled with electrons and it is stable. So that's the reason why the noble gases or inert gases will not take place in reactions. Because they are all already stable, they don't want to be unstable. But sodium, if you consider a chlorine atom, so that will be combined together to get sodium uh, chloride, because the chlorine needs one electron and sodium has to donate one electron. So both will be combined and become stable compound. So if you consider atomic interaction between the two atoms, on uh, the basis of the poles. You can see if you consider two atoms that are separated by distance, nucleus is having positive charge, electrons are having negative charge. So when two atoms are together, are separated by only a small distance, and will be attracted, the nucleus, positive charge nucleus, will be attracted by the negatively electrons, charged electrons on the second atom, similarly. And it will be attracted and at a particular point, what happens is the, the positive nucleus of the one atom and the positive uh, nucleus of the second atom will start to repel. So there, there is a repulsive force as well. So whenever the distance between the two atoms gradually reduces. And also that same is applicable to the negatively charged electrons as well. So from the graph, we can see this is a, a blue line is given, uh, blue, uh, blue color is given to the attractive force. 
green is given for the repulsive force and there is a net force that is sum of attractive force and repulsive force and at a particular point the attractive force and repulsive force coincide together and that means there is no more interaction there is a arrow that is interatomic separation that is a stable kind of separation the reason why the force that is given in the x axis is exactly zero that means there is no net force acting the prop mm. um, an optimum attractive force and optimum repulsive force will be there so the net force will be zero at a point where considered as r node that is interatomic separation is r node then the net force will be zero so if you consider that the force in terms of energy that is potential energy attractive energy as well as repulsive energy here also if you consider that same point r not that has been indicated in the second graph that is the equilibrium separation equilibrium separation is stable separation between two atoms and above that graph the repulsive energy will be there more for the atoms if you the again that atoms get separate um, against atom gets closer together so that there is a large possibility of repulsive uh, energy that has been generated between the positive nucleus as well as the negative electrons but in the bottom side of the graph if you consider the two atoms and the distance is more then the atoms will be having a tendency to join together because of the attraction of negatively charged electrons with the positive charged nucleus of the another atom so there there will be an equilibrium point at which both the atoms will be separated by a distance that is r not the atomic distance that is considered to be the equilibrium uh, distance and if you extend that point and uh, draw a vertical line you can see the net energy line net energy graph plot where we can find a point that is minimum energy so that means if it consider net force point at that particular point there will be minimum potential energy of that uh, atoms so that simply means there won't be uh, taking place in any kind of uh, activity since the energy is minimum and there will they will be in stable equilibrium condition atomic interaction why this atomic interaction happens attractive force is due to electrostatic attraction between the electrons and nucleus repulsive force is due to when separation is less than equilibrium repuls repulsion takes place between nuclei of interacting atoms or electrons of interacting atoms so the inference is at equilibrium separation net force is zero and potential energy will be minimum so that is the reason why if you consider that energy the previous that is a, a, a graph e note that is the bond energy that clearly interprets whether the material is having higher melting point or higher elastic model modulus like sort of properties so if you consider solid it is closely compact together the interatomic distance is much more stable so it will be that because of a high bonding a stronger bonding it will be difficult to separate the atomic particles so that is the reason why the melting point of such metals such uh, such solid solid bodies are higher compared with the others if you consider liquid if you melt if you melt the material it will be in a liquid form so that atom atoms can move in move accordingly more free to uh, move so such sort of thing it will be atomic bonding will be lesser so higher bond energy means higher melting point as well as higher elastic modulus so the three types of primary interactive atomic bonds are there ionic bonding covalent bonding as well as metallic bonding which is considered to be stronger bonds then secondary bonds like uh, van der waals forces as well as hydrogen bonds which are much weaker bonds if we take an example of uh, graphite structure we are having the covalent bonds between the carbon but because of the layers different layers available to the graphite the layers will be having van der waals forces much weaker forces comparing with the primary interatomic uh, bonds so that is the reason why it is considered to be softer uh, material so if you look into detail about its primary atomic and interatomic bond first one is ionic bond that is between metallic and non metallic atoms so metallic atom give valence electrons to the non metallic atom so take an example sodium atom you can see one electron is uh, considered to be an excess which make that unstable but if you consider chlorine atom it require one atom the third shell to become stable so by donating that is electro positive 
positivity atoms, the sodium atom will be donating the electron. At the same time, the electronegativity chlorine atom will be accepting the electron. So thereby, it will be forming ions. That is much stable ions. So there will be Coulombic attraction between two oppositively charged ions. So we can see there is an electron uh, transfer from the sodium to the chlorine. The bond is covalent bond. Here also it is a stronger bond, but there is a sharing of electrons rather than permanent transfer. It is simply sharing of valence electrons to get a stable configuration. For example, methane, if you consider CH4. In the case of carbon atoms, only four electrons uh, at the outer shell. So hydrogen atom, you consider only elect one uh, electron. So it can be combined four times with the carbon atom. So thereby we will get a CH4, which is a stronger bond. So it is formed between atoms of similar electronegativity. But in the case of ionic bonds, one is electropositivity uh, uh, atom, the other one will be electronegativity, uh, uh, having electronegativity. So we can see examples like diamond, silicon, germanium also have covalent bonds. So diamond is one of the uh, hardest material. We can see covalent bonds to be uh, stronger, uh, providing the atom with the stronger bonds. The type is metallic bond. That, that is uh, experienced in uh, metals, mainly metals. So atoms have fixed position in the crystal. So here the valence electrons are free to move as free electrons, forming an electron cloud. And there will be positive cores, ions, ion cores are as well. So metallic bond arises out of the Coulombic attraction between these two oppositively charged species the electron cloud and the ion cores. So due to free electrons, uh, because of the free electrons, very high conductivity is possible in the case of metals. So if you look into the secondary bonding, that is Van der Waals bonding, that is much more weaker. So weaker in comparison to primary bonds, typically 10 kilojoules, uh, per mole. It's only the bone strength. It's arise due to atoms molecule dipoles which form due to separation of positive and negative species of an atom or molecule. Bonding result from columbic attraction between positive dipole and negative of one atom to the negative positive of adjacent atoms. So in graphite bonding we can see between the layers there's Van der Waals force of attraction so which is much weaker comparing to the primary interatomic bond. So this is uh, the figure that showing the graphic structure. The carbon-carbon will be having covalent bond, but in the case uh, separate layers are bonded with the help of Van der Waals bonding. So that is the reason why it's considered to be one of the softer material. So we can see the positive and negative dipoles, dipoles that will be attracted together, and it's much weaker the, in, in terms of bond strength. Then another type of bonding is hydrogen bonding. So this type of bonding is found in molecules that have hydrogen as one of the constituent. Electrostatic interaction between hydrogen and another atom of high electronegativity. You can see H2O, water molecule is a good example of this type of bonding. That is between hydrogen of one molecule with oxygen of another molecule. Of uh, the different bonds uh, that we studied, primary interactive bonding, as well as secondary bonding. We can see ionic and covalent bonds are much, much stronger because the bone strength is up to 1000 kilojoules per mole. So those materials having ionic covalent bond, having higher melting point as well as strength, hardness, mechanical properties will be superior uh, for those materials having ionic and covalent bonds. Lower conductivity, behavior is brittle. Example like ceramics, diamond, etc. versus this sort of bonding. The next is metallic bonds. It's a moderate bone strength is there. If you consider mercury, then tungsten, then 68 kilojoules per mole as well as 80, 849 kilojoules uh, per, uh, per mole. Even if we can see some sort of uh, tungsten uh, material, so also having a good, good better, sorry, better amount of uh, bone strength. That is the reason why it possesses higher melting point. So bone strength is there, melting point is higher, strength, hardness, etc. increases with the 
atomic number. So in the case of metallic bonds, there is a dependence with the atomic number. More, uh, uh, more the value of atomic number, more melting point as well as uh, the properties. Behavior is generally tactile. Then secondary bonds if you come, uh, come across, Van der Waals, the bone strength is weak. You can see argon and chlorine uh, molecules, 7.7 .7 kilojoules per mole and 31 kilojoules per mole. So bone strength is very less compared with the earlier bonds. Then hydrogen bond, it's a, it's a weak bone strength. You can see the compounds comprising hydrogen as the primary constituent gets 35. Ammonia, 35 kilojoules per mole. Water, 51 kilojoules per mole. So this is uh, the summary of the bone strength of different bones that we studied uh, for atomic interaction. Okay.